Hey photographers, Panasonic has joined the full frame frenzy with the S1, a camera that's larger and heavier than any camera I've reviewed. But let's start with photos. In spite of the weight, I brought it on a holiday to Holland, where I took pictures of tulips at the King's Day celebrations in Leiden and at the parade celebrating the liberation of the Netherlands in 1945. And we stayed in some really photo-worthy Airbnbs in Leiden, Snake, Hilversum, and Maastricht. Panasonic provided their new optically stabilized 24 to 105 with a constant f4. The optical stabilization works with the in-body stabilization, so I was able to shoot handheld to a second. I'll go into detail later in this video. This is Panasonic's first full-frame model, and the 24 megapixel sensor delivers outstanding color, crisp images, great contrast, and provides better than average low light images. Now, of course, I also shot a lot of video, and as we come to expect from Panasonic, it's a solid performer, but with a 30 minute limit. Now, what was it like to haul this camera around for three weeks? After all, you don't want to be leaving it at your Airbnb, and I didn't. Mostly I carried it around my neck or in my hand, but even if it is manageable, it is heavy. The body alone tips the scales at just over a kilo. Lens adds another 680 grams. So there's nothing trivial here. You'd better be serious before you consider this model. Now there's an XQD card slot and an SD card slot supporting UHS-2 V90. The grip is big and solid. I like the slight ergonomic tilt on the back thumb wrist and the forward slant of the shutter release. Now the centered over the lens viewfinder is a thing of absolute beauty. Super high resolution. 5760 K dots with a 120 frame refresh somehow designed that my nose stays off the LCD. There's a dial for the diopter, a view mode key, and a viewfinder LCD switch all at your fingertips. The LCD is also higher than usual resolution, 2100 K dots. Now I was surprised that the LCD only flips up and down. I've come to expect a forward facing monitor from Panasonic. Guess it's not designed for selfies and vlogging. But if you are a low angle portrait mode shooter, the screen tilts sideways. And there's a third display, a mono status LCD. Now even when off, it displays battery status and remaining number of images or time if you're in video mode. Now the power switch is slightly awkward. There's no easy way to get there while holding the camera with my right hand. There's a mode dial on the left with a drive mode collar underneath. I'm not sure why the video position's on the mode and not the drive dial collar. Lots and lots of dial switches, buttons, and keys. I counted over 25. Behind the shutter, dedicated buttons to set white balance, ISO, and exposure compensation. And there's a button to illuminate the LCD. A lock switch, the review button, the video record button, focus key and mode dial, AF on button, focus and navigation joystick, Q button for the quick menu, menu set key and control dial, back display and delete keys. Now it all adds up to a camera that doesn't require a menu dive every time you need to access a setting. And one with a great deal of familiarity for those coming from full frame DSLR models. One, no, three more things. There's a function key on front and a function selection lever, as well as a dual duty function preview button. There are mic in and headphone out ports behind good sized rubber doors on the left, also USB-C and a full sized HDMI. And if that's not bonus enough, Panasonic provides a cable clamp for strain relief of both the HDMI and USB cables. It seems like the doors and ports each had different design teams. For the cards, it's slide and pull back, snap closed. For the battery, release and it opens, but to close, it has to be slid back. Then rubber gasket doors for the ports on the left. Now, you'll be forgiven if you miss the remote socket and there's an old school flash synchro connector. The centered under the lens tripod mount has lots of clearance for a quick release plate. The S1 has more aspects than most, including 65 to 24 and 2 to 1 panorama settings. All are crops of the 3 to 2 35 millimeter aspect. Standard and fine quality JPEGs, all combinable with RAW, and three size options. Large is the full 24 megapixel resolution. Now, I started by installing the free Lumix Sync app and then using the wizard to set up and connect. 
there are settings to automatically transfer images to the device and to record location information. I'll get to remote shooting later. This is a touch screen. First, use the menu to turn the touch tab on. Then touch the right side of the screen to open the menu. Touch can be used to tap and snap or just select the focus point. In addition to the on-screen options, the main menu can be touch navigated also. And touch works even when an external screen is connected. The touch pad setting enables the screen to be used as a focus selection panel while shooting with the viewfinder. The S1 has three shutter variations, full mechanical, electronic front, and full electronic. Here's the full mechanical at one second. The settings also have a half press shutter option, which releases with a soft press. The optically stabilized L mount 24 to 105 is a solid combination with this camera. A switch enables stabilization. Quarter turn manual zoom focused by wire. Images are sharp with excellent detail and color. Filter diameter 77 millimeters, closest focus is 30 centimeters for excellent close ups of tulips at Kokonoff. In addition to a focus switch, which is probably best left on auto and managed from the camera settings, a lock switch prevents accidental zooming. Before setting the exposure, select a meter mode from the menu, press disp to see the details behind the icons. Throughout the menus, disp can be used to provide details on the highlighted function. If you regularly change the meter, assign a custom button. And in addition to the standard multi, average, and spot, there's highlight spot to keep highlights from overexposing. Use the front or rear dial in program mode for different combinations of aperture and shutter. Press the exposure compensation button to change the EV. Five stops up and down. In aperture priority, again, both front and rear dials set the aperture f4 to f22 on the 24-105. Both dials switch to shutter in shutter priority, 1 over 8,000 down to 60 seconds. In manual, by default, front aperture, rear shutter. Now bulb can be set, it maxes to about 30 minutes. A numerical meter appears at the bottom of the screen. The settings menu turns on the histogram. Use the joystick or touch to position it where you want, and note that the two axis level activates here also. By default, the display does not preview the actual exposure. Turn on constant preview for that. The dedicated ISO key opens the ISO settings, 100 to 51,200, as well as auto. Auto ISO can be controlled with a lower and upper limit setting, and there's also a minimum shutter speed setting. And there's an extended ISO menu setting, which reveals a low 50 setting and high settings from 64,000 to 204,000. The Q key opens a quick settings menu, which is useful, but doesn't give access to all of the functionality. For example, a Kelvin preset can be selected, but can't be adjusted. Press the white balance key for the selection panel, starting with three auto options, standard, a cool variant that provides a white low light image, while W provides a warmer incandescent lighting tone. Continue to press the key to select from a standard selection of presets, and then four custom slots. Capture using a gray card, and then use the red, green, and blue amber panel to make further adjustments as needed. And then there are four Kelvin presets. 2,500 to 10,000 are available in 100 step increments with a handy reference scale. Color profiles, here called photo styles, include natural and flat three variations on black and white, and three video settings, we'll get back to those. Each has several control settings, which, as you can see from saturation, operate over a wide range. For custom settings, there are four My Styles positions, selecting the base along with the adjustments. And those settings include adjustments to highlight and shadow curves to alter the contrast. The S1 supports HLG, hybrid log gamma, an extended dynamic range setting developed for video, but here applied to stills. Both full res and 4K settings are supported, as the HLG standard requires a display device like a TV that understands HLG to display properly. And in this mode, only two photo styles are available with a limited adjustment set. At this point, I think the setting's more experimental than useful. 
unless you already have an HLG capable set. And if you plan to shoot HLG photos but don't have an HLG display, turn on the HLG View Assist, which applies a conversion to properly display the images on the LCD screen or the HDMI output for use with standard screens. Filter settings access 22 filter effects. These are not the simple presets found on most cameras, as they all have adjustable parameters to fine-tune the filter. A high-resolution mode combines multiple exposures into a single 96 megapixel image. This requires a tripod and a non-moving subject. Options simultaneously capture a standard image and delay the shutter to reduce camera vibration. The resulting images are raw files about four times larger than the standard image with the 12,000 by 8,000 pixel resolution. It's an astounding level of detail. This is a one-to-one -one mapping of the 96 megapixel photo to 4K video pixels. Compare that to the standard 24 megapixel file. Now, there are also correction modes if there's motion. Motion 1 compromises image quality and may produce a ghost. Mode 2 attempts to eliminate ghosting but produces a smaller image. For focus settings, press the AF mode key. The Panasonic continues to offer the widest range of focus options. The focus system uses contrast AF. And as with white balance, press again to cycle through the options, a capability I find quite useful, as I only have to find one button, not a button and a dial. Select the mode, single continuous or manual, from the selector. The setting is displayed at the top of the screen. The first focus option, Face Eye Body Animal, identifies those objects in the frame. And it identifies the objects quickly. But in stills mode, even in auto continuous, you have to press the AF on or shutter to focus the selected object. Use touch to switch to another identified object or face. Now it works, but it's not fast. In video mode, using continuous, focus shifts when the object is touched. Tracking, in AF Continuous, provides an unsizable frame to identify the object, then soft press the shutter or AF on key to focus. There are options to fine tune the operation of the AF Continuous mode with four presets for stills and two adjustable parameters for video mode. In video mode, tracking works better. With the default settings, it even switches sides as the locomotive goes around the track. The auto area with 225 points can be slow and sometimes gets lost. Zone a horizontal or vertical strip which can be sized and positioned or zone oval. Again with the ability to size and position but not great at focus. One area plus which expands when the subject moves and finally opia is in focus. And one area which does not expand and focuses on Martin. Both can be sized and positioned using the joystick. An interesting Easter egg here, you can switch between the current position and center by pressing the joystick. For even greater precision, pinpoint, which provides an expanded view of the focus point while hitting its mark. There are also hidden options available from the menu, show to provide a square zone and to create three custom areas. Use touch to select the rectangles for the custom focus area. In manual focus mode, turning the lens's focus ring punches in for a close-up view and a blue peaking display appears to assist. The menu's peaking options provide five levels and many more color options than the competition. A menu option can lock the focus ring in manual focus mode to prevent accidental adjustment and this can be assigned to a function button. Now for back focus, use manual focus and the AF on button, which works in manual mode. Martin and Opia's focus distance is slightly different. And Panasonic's post focus feature enables you to choose the focus point after you've taken the picture. It works best with non-moving objects. Now using the 6K mode will provide 18 megapixel images. There's a slight crop in 6K, even more in 4K. After you press the shutter, the S1 records all of the possible focus points and saves them into a video file. 
Then touch the subject you want in focus and save one or more images with the selected focus objects. Or select to merge the focus points into a single image. This takes a few seconds, but provides an image where they're both focused. Now, this is great for macro work, but also for food photos, as I often regret my focus decision when I get home. The S1 also has a focus bracket setting. Options set the size of the focus step and the number of images to be taken. It takes a few test shots to identify the appropriate settings for your scene. Now, when you're satisfied, either select the image you want or create the photo stack in Photoshop. For a rack focus in video, touch is the ideal solution and the speed can be adjusted using the AFC video settings. This is fast and this is slow. Image stabilization on the S1 is among the best I've experienced. I've never been able to handhold a two second exposure before, but I was able to do that here. It's a combined lens and sensor five axis system. There's a specific setting to allow smooth panning, automatically detecting vertical or horizontal movement. And for image shifts and giggles, turn on the IS status scope. I'm not quite sure how to interpret or what to do with this information, but it is cool to see the image stabilization system in action. And this display is not available when you're in video mode. What's interesting is that if this is how much my hands are shaking, that's a pretty solid image. The S1, like other Panasonic models, offers two ways to take burst photos. There's the standard mode, which takes JPEG and or RAW images, as well as the 6K 4K mode, which records a video file and enables you to extract images. Use the menu to assign the variation you want to the two continuous setting positions on the drive caller. In standard mode, there are three rates, H, M, and L, which are nominally 9.5 and 2 frames per second, in the bottom right of the screen, pictures remaining, and the buffer status while shooting. High speed, saving fine JPEGs with manual exposure and focus settings to just the XQD card, saves just less than 9 per second for the first 6 seconds, slows slightly to about 6 per second before hitting the buffer, and slowing to about 4 per second. And these are full resolution 24 megapixel images. Writing out the buffer takes less than 10 seconds. In the 6K 4K modes, HDMI output limits the functionality. The 6K mode runs 30 frames per second, recorded into an MP4 video file, and this rate can be sustained for up to 10 minutes. Although this uses an electronic shutter, by default, a shutter sound is played. For inobtrusive operation, activate silent mode from the menu. This switches to the electronic shutter and suppresses all sound and light from the camera, in any mode. In playback, an image from the video can be selected and saved as an 18 megapixel image. A 4K version captures 60 frames per second, but only 8 megapixel images can be extracted. And for the first time, I now see that the iPad stopwatch display isn't as granular as I thought. These modes offer variants to record while the shutter's pressed, or use the shutter to start and stop, or pre-burst, which captures about one second before and after the shutter press. In addition to focus, there are brackets for exposure, aperture, and two white balance options, one for Kelvin color temperature, the other for color correction. Each has adjustable options. A shutter delay of one to eight seconds can be set, and there's also a self-timer mode with two and 10 second settings and a three exposure 10 second mode. Now, although the menu is generally good about explaining why a feature isn't available, it failed me here. Luckily, the manual does list all the exclusions. Time lapse, activated from the drive caller, up to 10,000 minus one images at intervals from a second to 99 minutes will be shooting well into next year. Always nice to have a duration estimate. There's good on-screen status feedback and when the time lapse is over, the S1 offers to create a video from the images. Select the settings and then wait for the processing. Now, if you're shooting just for video, use the 16 by 9 aspect and the medium size, which better matches 4K output.
With the multi-exposure setting, up to four exposures can be combined in a single image, with options to manage gain and to view the overlay while composing the images. Drive mode capabilities do not include panorama. Video is selected from the exposure mode dial. There's no crop, just the change in aspect ratio. Video exposure mode is set on the menu. The red video record button starts video recording in any mode. In video mode, the shutter also starts and stops recording. The video menu seems to have its own settings for many options, but they are duplicates of the still settings. Switch them here, they also switch on the stills menu. However, you can disconnect them using the creative video combine settings. The still icon indicates they're linked, the movie icon indicates they're independent. I find this a powerful and very useful feature, mostly because the video shutter speed now remains locked at 1 60th, but also to set separate white balance and color profiles. The S1 records 4K 60 frames at 150 megabits, 30 and 24 frames at 100 megabits. Only the 16 by 9 video aspect is supported. HD rates are 60 at 28 megabits and 30 at 20. High speed settings can do half speed in camera at 24 frames and 30 at 1 5th and 1 6th with a crop. The AVC HD codec is available but only to SD cards and the high efficiency video codec is available but only in combination with hybrid log gamma which as mentioned requires an HLG capable display. The Panasonic provides three photo styles with video appropriate gamma curves According to the manual, Cine Like D prioritizes dynamic range and is recommended for color grading. Cine Like V prioritizes contrast. The 709 setting uses the ITU standard to minimize overexposure. However, don't overlook the ability to create a custom profile from settings like natural and flat, with the ability to adjust the highlight and shadow curves, or make other adjustments to saturation and hue, as well as sharpness lots of creative control available here. Zebra is available for exposure 1 and 2 can be set independently and can be assigned to a function button for easier switching. Behavior is slightly odd. As I adjust the ISO the zebra disappears and doesn't reappear until I press OK. In video stabilization switches to always regardless of the still setting and the pan option isn't available. The two video specific settings improve stabilization. E stabilization crops in, maintaining the full 5 axis capability. And for a static shot, boost mode further enhances stabilization. And this is a handheld shot, handicapped with the Atomos recorder mounted on the flash shoe. Now, although there's no digital zoom, using the APS C sensor crop can also extend your lens's reach. I do appreciate audio inputs and output provided on the S1. And there's a nicely sized audio meter display, along with an option to disable it. Input levels can be adjusted in 1 dB increments. The onboard limiter can be disengaged. The wind filter has four settings. The flexible mic input socket supports plug-in power or line input. Further settings support the optional Panasonic shotgun and XLR input adapter. The final setting matches the sound output to the headphones, either to the live scene or the viewfinder image. Headphone level settings are found on the settings screen. For the one candle scene, we've turned up the ISO to 25,600. We captured a custom white balance and I'm very happy with the exposure and the white balance. What I'm not happy with is the face detect, which at this low light level doesn't seem to be working, but we are in autofocus continuous and whatever the square or focus thing is that's working, it is working. I am in focus. Now there's one more thing that I want to show you, which is to turn up the ISO to the very maximum to 51,200. And even at that level, there's really a very low amount of noise in the image. For a full frame sensor, the S1 has extraordinarily little rolling shutter effect, either in 4K or in the HD 1080 modes. Remote control 
using the Panasonic Lumix Sync app is full featured and mimics the controls on the camera for white balance, ISO, and the Q menu to select photo styles. Video record format and quality can be set and the self shot mode does a mirror flip. And although the response is slow, touch focus does work. The S1 is full of customizations. The Q menu has two display options with and without the image preview. The stills and video versions are independent and all 12 positions can be assigned to a selection of functions. The 11 function keys with independent controls for record and playback can be assigned to a longer list. In addition to the press and change feature I enjoy, the white balance, ISO and EV can also be set to adjust only while the button is held down. Some of the back panel keys can be illuminated. On 1 is always, on 2 activates with the LCD panel light key. There are multiple auto review options. The live view image can be set to black and white and the screen has a night mode option. A personal menu of three pages with eight options each can be created. I wanted still features on page one and video on two, but there's no simple way to place entries on a specific page. The S1 has a full suite of review and playback options. Press DISP to view five screens of settings associated with the image. Raw files can be converted to JPEG. In addition to contrast, highlight, shadow, and white balance, Photo styles can be selected, but not filters. Video files can be divided, and still frames can be captured from video. The hierarchical menu is well designed, nicely organized, and easy to navigate. It's a model I would recommend others to follow. Help is easily available. However, the dimmed features should have a less generic prompt. The sheer scope of the S1's features requires a familiarization learning curve, and the manual details the alternate ways to access features and provides comprehensive details about the exclusions and conditions for all the settings. Kudos to Panasonic here. Battery is good. It's a big battery that lasts longer than average, but the charging stuff is baffling. There's a cable to connect to the adapter, then a cable from the adapter which plugs into the camera using USB-C. Then the battery charger itself, which also connects via USB-C. Did no one look at these four pieces and say, we can do better? Recharges are faster than average, and the camera can be powered with any USB-C PD type charger or external battery. Uh, if one of the advantages you're looking for in a mirrorless camera is small size and weight, that's not a benefit you'll find here. And although many of Panasonic's great features using video to capture burst or post-focus images are here, others like the forward-facing screen and unlimited video recording are not. And as this is Panasonic's first foray into full frame, there are not many L-mount lenses available yet. And for many of us, the price will be challenging. But if you're looking for astounding image quality with full frame control over depth of field, the S1 provides advantages that Micro Four Thirds cannot. Thanks for watching. And I do enjoy interacting with you, so please share your civil thoughts and relevant comments. I reply to all. And then I highly recommend that you go out and shoot until your memory card is full and your battery is empty. Oh, one more thing. If you do enjoy my detailed and honest reviews of cameras, please join me as a subscriber. Thanks.